Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on healthy reference values for video fluoroscopic measures of swallowing. My name is Katrina Steele and I am a scientist and director of the Swallowing Rehabilitation Research Laboratory here at KITE, which is the research arm of the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute University Health Network. This is a re-recording of a webinar that I delivered uh, in late March of 2019 for a dysphagia interest group here in Toronto and I'm re-recording it for wider distribution uh, through our website. So I hope that you find this information helpful. So to begin with, just a slide with my disclosures, and I will point out that the research that I'm going to be sharing in today's talk was funded by a grant from the National Institutes of Health in the United States. And before I go any further, I want to give a shout out to the members of my research team here at the Swallowing Rehabilitation Research Laboratory, who really did a lot of the legwork behind the information that I'll be sharing with you today, um, and without whom this work would not be possible. So swallowing is an activity that we all do many times a day without a second thought. It's something that we take for granted, and yet we understand it to be a very complex task in terms of human behavior. We believe, based on the literature, that there are at least 26 pairs of bilaterally organized muscles involved in swallowing located in the upper aerodigestive tract and that the activity of five cranial nerves is critical for swallowing uh, sensory and motor function, and that all of this activity is coordinated and governed by a central pattern generator that is located in and around the medulla and the adjacent reticular formation. We understand that the coordination of breathing and swallowing is absolutely critical for this function to uh, occur without problem, and that the activity of the brainstem centers that are involved in controlling both breathing and swallowing function are to some degree um, under uh, that they accept input from cortical areas that can lead to modulation of the motor pattern that then unfolds. But swallowing, of course, can go wrong, as illustrated in this video, and I would suggest to you that the majority of our patients suffer from two overriding uh, potential problems in swallowing function. The first, of course, as illustrated in this video, is swallowing safety, that is the ability to swallow without material entering the airway. And the second overriding function is swallowing efficiency, that is the ability to clear material through the pharynx, from the mouth, through the pharynx, into the esophagus in a timely fashion. And these two overriding functions uh, rely on a lot of background physiology. And unfortunately, when we receive our training, we are taught to focus uh, on things that are going wrong in swallowing or things that appear to be going wrong in swallowing. And we don't get a lot of opportunity to uh, get exposure to healthy, normal swallowing. And so this has been an interest in my lab to uh, explore and establish reference uh, values for measurements of swallowing that might help us as clinicians to understand uh, what's going on in our patients. So I would argue that in order to treat a person with dysphagia properly, we need to understand the mechanisms of their impairment. That is, what's wrong with the various components of a swallow that ultimately contribute to that swallow either being unsafe or inefficient or both. And in order to understand mechanisms of impairment, we first need to have a, a healthy reference context so that we understand what's normal, what's within normal limits, and that we can recognize components that are outside those normal limits. Now, just for a moment, I'll share a brief anecdote uh, with respect to healthy swallowing. Uh, back uh, quite a few years ago, when I was beginning my journey as a doctoral student, um, having worked clinically for uh, several years, I thought I'm likely to need 
uh, to teach people about normal swallowing, and I need a video example of normal swallowing to use in my teaching. And so I thought, what better than to uh, convince my radiologist at the time to allow me to uh, undergo a video fluoroscopy so that I would have a teaching tape of a healthy swallow. Of course, the story became really interesting when I discovered to my horror uh, that, in fact, I had residue in my pharynx on that particular day, um, just above my upper esophageal sphincter. And over the years that followed that situation, I had a lot of fun uh, using that teaching tape um, paired with uh, a fictitious clinical uh, case history. And it was not difficult at all for me to um, lead an audience along that clinical history scenario such that they would see that residue and conclude that the person in the video had dysphagia. Now, I don't believe I did have dysphagia. I haven't developed dysphagia symptoms since that time. And moreover, I had an opportunity to do another video fluoroscopy on myself just a few years ago, so about 15 years after the first occasion, and discovered reassuringly that I no longer had residue, so I was cured. And um, I uh, believe uh, strongly that one of the major factors that contributed to the difference in the appearance of my swallow uh, between the first video and the second video was in fact the barium that we were using. At the time of the original video, we just took barium uh, off the shelf and um, sort of eyeballed its preparation thought it looked thin. Um, and these days in my lab, we're much more careful about the recipes that we use for preparing barium uh, so that it would not be likely to create an artifact of coating on the mucosal walls of the pharynx. And so that's just one example of where our training in terms of looking for abnormality might mislead us um, to interpret uh, a person as having impairment when in fact they don't. There are plenty of debated questions in our field about what is normal in swallowing uh, that really uh, underlie some of the decisions that we make clinically. For example, I'll just run through a few, but we lack clarity about which events can constitute the end of the oral phase and the beginning of the pharyngeal phase of swallowing. Uh, we were taught originally by Dr. Logeman to look for that time frame when the bolus passed particular anatomical landmarks. Uh, she used the fossil arches. Uh, in the literature, other people have used the posterior nasal spine or the shadow of the ramus of the mandible, which has really become more common today. Uh, other people in the literature use the opening and closing of particular valves, such as the uh, junction between the tongue and the palate, uh, to mark the end of the oral phase. And uh, in terms of the beginning of the pharyngeal phase, the convention is largely to use the onset of the rapid hyoid burst movement, but there isn't established consensus on these boundary events. Another commonly debated uh, question in the field is where should the head of that bolus be when the swallow starts? And the inverse of this question, of course, is when we see the head of the bolus past the point where we believe it should be at the point that that swallow starts, should we be concerned? And on the slide, you can see a depiction of four anatomical levels where the head of the bolus might be. These were used uh, by Dr. Bonnie Martin Harris in her development of the MBS IMP scale on initiation of, um, of the pharyngeal phase of swallowing. Where is that bolus head? And uh, I'm showing on the left of the slide a, a paper that she wrote um, that showed that, in fact, there's variation in this phenomenon in healthy people and that um, it, when they're swallowing in a sort of natural situation, that it might not be unusual for that bolus to be below the ramus of the shadow of mandible when the swallow begins. And so uncertainty in our field about when we should call that normal or abnormal. 
And we do know that a number of other factors might influence our measurement of this phenomenon. We know that where the bolus sits prior to swallow onset is different for liquids versus boluses that are chewed, and that with chewed boluses we see a phenomenon called aggregation or collection of the material in the upper pharynx around the vollecula. Um, prior to swallow initiation, and that's normal. Uh, we also know from work by Stephanie Daniels and then subsequent work from my lab that where the bolus uh, is at swallow onset will differ depending on whether the patient has been uh, told to wait for a command or a cue to initiate their swallow. And we know that this can also differ uh, between single and sequential sips, straw versus cup drinking, and may vary as a function of age and sex. These are still open questions. Another big debate in the literature relates to how long we expect particular uh, measures of timing to be with relation to swallowing. Things like oral bolus transit time, uh, what's been called stage transition duration or swallow reaction time, which is the uh, interval between the bolus entering the pharynx, passing the ramus of the mandible, until the onset of that hyoid burst movement. And you can see other uh, timing uh, measures that you might look for in the literature for which the expected durations remain really undetermined. And one of the reasons that these uh, estimates of timing measures in the literature are variable is that we have lots of different measures. So people choose to compare events, uh, different events. And in a review of this topic that my former doctoral student, Dr. Sonia Malfenter, did during her dissertation research, she found, in fact, 119 different timing measures across articles found in the literature. So a huge amount of variability a lack of consensus about what we should be comparing, and then perhaps actual variability in the way these measures unfold in healthy people. Similarly, a lot of debate about how far structural movement should be, for example, for the hyoid. And again, Dr. Malfenter looked at this topic uh, in her dissertation, and she did a review, a meta-analysis, if you will, of um, reported normal hyoid movement in swallowing in healthy individuals in the literature. Um, you can see that the slides um, here and on the left we have uh, means and confidence intervals in the literature reported for swallows um, in healthy individuals and you can see with the red box that the reported range of normal hyoid measurement in millimeters goes from as small as two millimeters on the tail of those confidence intervals up to 28 millimeters. And if that's true, if it's normal for hyoid movement to vary that to that degree, then how are we as clinicians supposed to interpret uh, whether a patient's hyoid movement is within or outside the normal range if the normal range is so variable? And so um, one of the things we've been sort of looking at in our research over the years is is there variability in here that we can um, take away by more careful methods, for example, or by looking at different ways of measurement? Another common question uh, that you might wonder is whether uh, laryngeal penetration is in fact something normal or is it something that you should be concerned about in your patients? And here we have data from Dr. Logeman's lab that does say that um, in healthy uh, swallowing, it might not be unusual to see penetration aspiration scale scores of two, that is um, entry of the material into the laryngeal vestibule, but then being ejected. And uh, so if that's true, then um, perhaps we shouldn't be concerned about it in our patients. But these are still um, questions that many of us have. And here's some more. Uh, I could go on for a long time about these kinds of questions, but what is normal sip size? Um, how many swallows are normal for a single sip? Uh, is residue ever normal in the pharynx? And what would be the upper thresholds of normal for residue? And uh, if we uh, think of 
first of all, having some sort of task that we consider a reference. So if we define normal uh, as perhaps a thin liquid bolus, then what happens to those measures as we change bolus consistency or bolus volume? Uh, and, and how do we establish our, our reference context of what to expect when we perform different tasks with our patients in assessment? And then, of course, a really big question and an important practical question is for you as clinicians, given all this um, potential information, those 119 timing measures, for example, which ones do you really need to pay attention to in your assessment in order to establish whether a person really has an impairment that is in their physiology that is leading to an important functional problem, perhaps penetration aspiration or residue, uh, and which of those parameters are also amenable to treatment so that we might focus our attention and assessment on these high yield parameters that are likely to be important to guide clinical decision making. So these are all questions that we've been struggling with in my research for a while. And uh, so the work I'm going to talk to you about is a step towards answering some of these questions. And as we did that, our decision was that we wanted to establish a standard operating procedure for rating our video fluoroscopies. Um, and that included developing very clear definitions for the things that we were going to rate. Uh, where possible, we wanted to adopt quantified measurement. That is, we wanted to count things or measure things with a ruler um, such that it was a numeric answer and one where two people could make the measurement and we could compare those measurements and ask uh, how reliable those measurements were. And so as part of our standard research operating procedure that you're going to hear about today, um, in all of our research work, we always have everything rated twice. And then we have rules that operate in our research such that when two raters disagree, uh, we have decisions about which of those disagreements then get flagged and taken into a conference where we uh, debate and argue and perhaps remeasure together uh, so that we we can establish consensus regarding the accurate measurement of that particular behavior. And we call this standard operating procedure the ASPECT method, which stands for the analysis of swallowing physiology, the events, the kinematics, and the timing. And so today I'm really excited to present to you uh, initial results using the ASPECT method to establish reference values regarding swallowing in healthy people. This slide shows you an overview of the, the steps in the ASPECT method. These are research steps, and I think it's important to say that up front. Uh, and over time, we hope to be able to identify key steps in this method that um, can become priorities in clinical practice. So the first thing that we do from a, a geeky research perspective is we take all of our video fluoroscopy recordings and we cut them up into shorter recordings, one recording for each bolus. Now a bolus might have more than one swallow. And so um, once we've spliced those videos, we actually assign them randomly um, to at least two raters in our lab. And the first thing those raters do when they open the recording is they count how many swallows they see for that bolus. Then for each of those swallows, we like to call them sub-swallows when there's more than one, they rate uh, safety using the eight-point penetration aspiration scale. So we get um, a number for each and every swallow. Now we also document um, in the case that we might see an early event uh, on the first sub-swallow, perhaps we see uh, penetration uh, to the level um, of the laryngeal vestibule, but it stays there. So that would be a penetration aspiration scale score of three. But perhaps as subsequent swallows occur for that bolus, um, maybe we don't see any new material added to that original uh, penetration uh, event, but maybe that bolus um, 
that material recovers and is later ejected, or maybe it drips further down and evolves to become a more serious event. So we make those detailed observations uh, for that bolus. We then go into the purple boxes, which are a critical phase in our rating. Um, and what we ask our raters to do is to document the frame number uh, at which a whole series of key events occur. And you can see um, one list of key events shown on this slide, and these are the ones that we typically track. Um, you could have others and or choose to only look at some of these events. But this is a very important descriptive stage for us that then allows us later to do two things. First of all, we can look at the timing intervals between paired events. So we could look at the time interval between 4a, bolus passing mandible, until onset of hyoid burst, and that would give us the measure of swallow reaction time. And also because we require our raters to agree on when these frames are for each of these events, then that allows us in a next stage of rating to carry those particular frames forward for pixel-based rating or other uh, ratings. And those are shown on the right-hand side of the slide. For example, once we've established the frame at which um, the hyoid burst starts for B, that allows us to then do an ordinal judgment of where the bolus head is on that frame. And we make sure in this way that before we get to these frame-specific measures of perhaps bolus location or pixel measures of uh, pharyngeal area, that our raters are looking at exactly the same frame when they make those decisions. So I will um, talk through some of these measures in more detail at, at later in the presentation. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this work has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, and we are um, partway into a big project looking at the physiological flow of liquids um, using this aspect method to characterize healthy uh, swallowing physiology and also how it differs in individuals with different types of um, medical diagnoses that might involve dysphagia. And so the data I'm going to share to you, with you today are from our healthy youngish cohort, um, which is individuals under the age of 60. And uh, we'll, we are now um, beyond this and into uh, measuring these same behaviors in a healthy older cohort over the age of 60. And so we had in this particular uh, data set half men and half women uh, with a mean age of 34 years and 40 individuals in total. Now, uh, why are we undertaking this? Surely other people have described some of these behaviors before. Uh, so one of the things that's different about our project is that the different tasks, um, particularly the boluses that we're giving to our participants, are uh, um, developed to map to the five liquid levels on the right-hand side of the uh, this framework image that you see here for ITSI, the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative. And if you don't already know about ITSI, I encourage you go to the ITSI website to learn more. Uh, this video shows you the ITSI flow test, which has been established as a practical way for people to measure uh, the consistency of liquids that they might be serving to their patients. Uh, the test involves filling a standard slip tip syringe to 10 milliliters uh, and then allowing that liquid to flow for 10 seconds. And then the fluid level, um, either uh, thin, slightly thin, Thick, mildly thick, moderately thick, or extremely thick depends on how much material is left behind in the syringe at that 10 second mark. And again, I encourage you to go to the ITSI website um, or download the ITSI app for more details on this testing method. 
So in our study, we wanted to look at all five of those levels from thin through to extremely thick, and we had to make some protocol decisions. And it's important for me to say at this point that some of these decisions um, may um, represent reasons why our data will look different than uh, data from other studies that have made different decisions. And over time, we will hope to um, do work to to confirm whether uh, the differences uh, are attributable to these methodological choices or not. Um, so the first thing uh, to say is that we used a low concentration of barium, a 20% weight to volume concentration. Uh, this decision is one that uh, we made many years ago in my lab, um, influenced by a paper by Fink and Ross that suggested that at 40% weight to volume barium concentration, uh, there might already be a slight therapeutic thickening of the barium uh, that might influence the frequency of penetration and aspiration. And so uh, influenced by that study, which I do think needs replication, um, we shifted to using a 20% concentration. Um, I should say for reference that Varabar uh, thin liquid is a 40% concentration. So we've been using something that is 50% is diluted compared to that concentration. Uh, and at this concentration, we can still reliably see the material on a video fluoroscopy, uh, but we believe there is much less chance of coating off the mucosa uh, and uh, hopefully avoiding artifact related to any thickening that comes with a greater concentration of barium. In the data that I'm going to share with you today, as we went thicker in consistency from thin barium, we used a gum-based uh, thickener to achieve those consistencies. Um, in this case, it was Nestle's uh, Resource Thicken Up Clear product. Um, and we will need to do further work to establish whether all gum-thickened liquids behave similarly uh, and to what degree gum-thickened liquids behave similarly to liquids thickened with other thickeners like starch or perhaps some of the newer age thickeners like carrageenan and locust bean gum. And finally, a really important protocol decision uh, at this stage was that all our video fluoroscopies are acquired at an image acquisition rate of 30 images per second. In fact, we use 30 pulses per second from the fluoroscope, and we record those on a recording system that is synchronized to capture those 30 images uh, per second. And so uh, you'll see as we move into the data that we have chosen to report timing intervals from this study in numbers of frames. First of all, it's important to say that each frame in this recording setup lasts 33 milliseconds. And of course, if you're recording at a different image acquisition rate, perhaps 15 images per second or 25 images per second, that you would have a different number of frames than we do at this rate. And so um, we, uh, in the manuscript uh, that I'll mention in a minute, have reported both frame-based timing intervals and converted those into milliseconds. Now, uh, I mentioned that we use the ITSI framework, and so we developed recipes for preparing 20% weight to volume barium in different consistencies. Uh, what we actually did was we started with a 20% weight to volume thin barium. Uh, we used uh, easy bake powdered barium to create that stimulus. And then we prepared recipes for thickening that product to the different consistencies shown on the slide. And these recipes have been published in the article referenced at the bottom of the slide. And I'll just mention also that on my lab's website, which is www.steelswallowinglab.ca, uh, we have a resource for clinicians called a barium calculator that will help you to develop standard recipes for uh, preparing barium in different consistencies, particularly if you're in a situation where you can't access the Verabar product line, uh, which comes already thickened. So once we get past those protocol decisions, uh, some other decisions that we made. First of all, uh, we decided to allow and encourage our participants to take 
natural sips. So that meant that they held the cup and we filled that cup with 40 milliliters of stimulus and we asked them to take a single sip. And rather than uh, controlling the volume of that sip, we weighed the cups before and after each sip and then derived the sip size from that. And of course, with the thicker consistencies, there was a, a spoon in the cup and they took a spoon full. And we also asked, uh, decided to use a non cued swallow paradigm. So they were just to swallow when they were ready. Uh, they weren't waiting around for us to give an instruction. So given those protocol decisions, I'm really excited to tell you that the reference data that I'll be uh, running through with you in this talk uh, is in press in the Journal of Speech Language Hearing Research. Uh, you can see um, a clip from the page proofs here, and I hope that this will be available um, very shortly, hopefully before the end of April 2019. And as part of that article, there's also an appendix, which is really the rating manual uh, for this process in case you want to try um, making some of these measures yourself. So let's walk through the different steps and what we learned about normal swallowing. Uh, and so I'll tell you, uh, first of all, that when I'm using the, the words normal swallowing, I'm meaning healthy, uh, younger individuals. And we're going to start by looking at results for thin liquid. Uh, and so, as I told you before, um, our participants... Um, produce these swallows and then our process involves splicing those recordings, uh, counting the number of swallows per bolus and documenting safety in the form of the penetration aspiration scale score uh, for each of those swallows. So what did we learn? Well, the first thing, which even precedes the video rating, is about sip volume. And we found in our data set that given the instructions with a 40 milliliter volume in a cup, that our participants on average took 12 milliliter boluses. This is actually very, very similar to previous uh, studies that have used similar protocols. Uh, and I think the important take-home message for you as clinicians here is to realize that if you are limiting your video fluoroscopy to volumes that fall below 10 milliliters, you're really under-challenging uh, the system and you may not be getting representative data in terms of capturing behavior that might uh, represent what the person is doing outside your assessment context. So I really strongly encourage you to make sure you get up to 10 milliliter volumes at least, um, and ideally include some natural sips in your protocol. In terms of how many swallows people did per bolus, um, I think this was actually a bit of a surprise to me. The median mode and... Um, What's the, and mean uh, number of swallows per bolus uh, pervasively throughout this data set was one. Um, I historically have thought that it was uh, reasonable to allow people to do a cleanup swallow. These data would suggest that it, that is in fact unusual. And so in terms of a take home message, I would say that certainly if you're seeing three swallows per bolus or four swallows per bolus in your patient, that that's outside the normal range and might be something you want to look at more clearly. And then also we saw no penetration and aspiration uh, as a rule uh, in this study. So it's, we did have a few occurrences of transient penetration, that is those scores of two on the penetration aspiration scale score where things briefly entered the laryngeal vestibule and left. And we had a couple of scores of five where that penetration uh, was deeper to the level of the vocal folds and stayed in the laryngeal vestibule. Uh, but these were not distributed across the participant group. Rather, they occurred in particular individuals who seemed to have patterns that were slightly different than everybody else. So uh, there's one individual I can think of in our data set who consistently um, had scores of two. That was their, their pattern. And all of the scores of five, there were only a handful of them, occurred in the same individual. So what about 
timing then, moving on to the sequence of events that we asked our raters to uh, document the frame numbers for. Well, one of those events, uh, 4C in this list, uh, is the frame of laryngeal vestibule closure. And I just want to uh, focus in on that event first before we get to the others. This uh, um, feature, looking at whether the laryngeal vestibule closes completely or not, uh, is one that I did not learn to look at when I was training uh, in video fluoroscopy rating. And I think that recent literature, including our work, is really pointing to this being an important feature for clinicians to pay attention to. It's not difficult to uh, go through your video and find the frame when the laryngeal vestibule is at its most closed and to ask yourself a binary question. Is that completely closed or is it still open? And there is a, a parameter looking at this in the um, MBSIMP, and there's also uh, new work coming out about laryngeal vestibule closure from the lab of Dr. Ianessa Humbert and her student Alicia Vose. And I think this is turning out to be a feature that tells important stories. And then we can derive timing measures, as I said, in frames and then convert those into milliseconds. And we've chosen to focus on particular pairs of events. Um, swallow reaction time I've mentioned already, um, looking at the interval between bolus entering the pharynx and then the onset of the hyoid burst. Then we look from hyoid burst to UES opening, and then we can look at UES opening duration. Uh, and then there are also important laryngeal events uh, that um, go sort of in parallel to those pharyngeal events. And so we have been calculating a measure proposed by Dr. Humbert called laryngeal vestibule closure reaction time, which is the interval between the onset of hyoid burst and that frame of maximum laryngeal vestibule approximation or complete closure. And then we can also measure the duration of that closure uh, until it opens again. So what we found with thin liquid uh, swallowing in this data set was that uh, we were able to identify, in fact, a very stereotyped and, and pretty well fixed sequence of pharyngeal events, and that the interval from the bolus passing the ramus of mandible until UES closure uh, was on average 21 frames long, which converts to somewhere between 650 and 750 milliseconds. And these, remember, are single sips without a cue, uh, and they're on average 12 milliliters. Now, just with respect to sequence, I just want to mention that um, there's previous work from Dr. Rebecca Leonard's uh, research and then um, with Dr. Malfenter uh, in my lab looking at sequencing uh, to try to figure out whether sequencing is fixed or variable. And um, uh, in those studies, laryngeal events were added into the mix. And it turns out that when you add laryngeal um, events into the mix, that there are a couple of pairs of events that can shift sequencing um, across uh, different swallows. Um, so we found uh, then hyoid burst, so the swallow reaction time from bolus passing mandible to hyoid burst onset was about seven frames or better uh, in our healthy uh, younger adults. And we found then that the interval from hyoid burst to laryngeal vestibule closure, that laryngeal vestibule closure reaction time measure, was on average um, five frames or better. Um, I mentioned before the, the sequencing of laryngeal events relative to pharyngeal events, and one of the things that's nice um, in this data set is that we noticed that if we portrayed it in, in the way shown on this slide, that in fact the time duration when the laryngeal vestibule was closed lined up very, very closely with the interval when the UES was open. And that makes beautiful biological sense. And so it seems that these things are really inextricably linked in healthy swallowing.
Finally, one other thing to uh, point out regarding timing was that we found a very close correspondence in, in event timing between the hyoid reaching its peak position and the frame of maximum UES opening or distension. And again, that seems to suggest biomechanical connections between traction of hyoid movement on the UES uh, that make really good sense. What about that bolus location at swallow onset or at hyoid burst question. So here we used Dr. Bonnie Martin Harris's four point um, ordinal scale to capture the location of the bolus at swallow onset. And uh, what we discovered was that in fact only one quarter of these thin liquid boluses in only one quarter of those cases was the bolus at or above the ramus of mandible at that frame of hyoid burst uh, onset. Uh, this is in agreement with Dr. Martin Harris's previous observations in older adults. Um, and we found, in fact, that if we look below that, that the bolus um, could really be at any of these locations. And these are healthy, younger adults. Um, and you can see that a third of the time the bolus was already at the piriform sinus at that frame of hyoid burst onset. So what does this mean? First of all, it means that when we see the bolus uh, beyond the ramus of mandible at swallow onset, that it's not abnormal. Uh, and, uh, and really, I hope we're not um, intervening with patients purely on this basis. Um, the other thing to mention is that the time intervals here are very short. So that um, deciding on this phenomenon uh, really is uh, critical on things like your frame rate and, and your choice of frame. So uh, we have examples in this data set where the bolus can travel from a score of zero to a score of three uh, from one frame to the next. Uh, and so uh, we're talking about a very rapid phenomenon of bolus movement, particularly with thin liquids. And, and so that's playing into the fact that we actually did see deep bolus position uh, in perfectly healthy uh, normal uh, swallowing. And I think uh, also here, maybe to reflect that in healthy people, we're able to handle this sort of variation without consequence. When we uh, go a few frames later to that frame of laryngeal vestibule closure, so up to five frames later, where is the bolus head by that point? Uh, and so by this point, the bolus is almost never uh, still up at the ramus of mandible or even in the molecular space, but it has progressed beyond that point. Uh, and the majority of time, this bolus is already in the upper esophagus, uh, with the bulk of the remaining cases um, showing the bolus at the level of the piriform sinuses. Moving on then to some of our uh, pixel-based measurements, I'll say here that uh, we have a convention where all measurements that we make in ImageJ software involve normalization using a scalar reference, which is the length of the C-spine from the bottom of C2 to the bottom of C4. This decision to use a scalar came out of Dr. Malfender's work and really her attempt to reduce some of the variation in measures of hyoid movement that we talked about earlier. Uh, when you look at the hyoid literature, it's clear um, that when those positions are measured in millimeters, that men show larger hyoid movement, uh, hyoid displacement measures than women as a rule. And uh, so what might explain this? Well, as we thought about it and, and others before us, particularly Dr. Adrian Perlman's work, it would seem that the distance that the hyoid moves might have something to do with the size of the person. Um, and so this is a slide that Dr. Malfenter um, built during her dissertation, and I love this slide, um, to give the idea that the distance moved by the hyoid might be analogous to stride length when you're running or walking. And obviously, um, Usain Bolt's stride length on the far left might be quite different than the stride length of the small runner beside him. 
And uh, we know as a rule that men are taller than women. And so uh, perhaps their neck lengths are different. And certainly the starting position of their larynx might be lower in men than women and might have to move further. Uh, so using that scalar reference, uh, one is able to take out that size-based variation uh, when doing uh, measures of hyoid uh, movement or position. In our work, we uh, have a convention of tracing hyoid position on every frame, starting five frames before the burst, until five frames after it um, uh, starts to move back down from its peak position. And this, of course, is a research approach. Um, you could quite easily just fast frame through to, through to when you think it's at its peak position and take measures on a single frame from a clinical uh, perspective. And as shown in the uh, image on the left of this slide, we can express the position of the hyoid on any frame uh, as a distance from the anterior inferior corner of C4. Uh, and we can express it in anatomically normalized units, that is, uh, percent of the C24 distance in different planes or vectors. So we can measure its position superiorly, anteriorly, or along the hypotenuse, the xy plane. And, and that's shown here. And uh, I should say that we also have uh, found over the years that it is adequate for us to simply take a single measure at peak rather than trying to subtract um, a starting or an ending position from that uh, uh, position. And so if you find that frame where the hyoid is at its furthest away uh, from C4, um, uh, these particular data suggest that that XY uh, plane measurement should be 169% um, of the C24 scalar. So somewhere around 165 to 175%. We can use similar methods for tracing other structural uh, distances, areas, um, movement uh, in the pharynx, and we do that to measure the diameter of UES opening, um, the area of the pharynx at maximum constriction, and the area of the pharynx at rest. Uh, here you can see a depiction of measuring that UES diameter. And in that this particular example, that yellow line corresponds to 32% uh, uh, of the C24 reference scalar. Uh, the normal uh, diameter of UES opening in on thin liquids in our data set uh, fell around 20%. So this particular example shows better UES opening than we might typically expect to see. But if you see opening that is below 15%, then you may have a situation of reduced UES opening. This image shows our approach to measuring pharyngeal area at rest. And here we trace the pharynx and we express that area here outlined in yellow uh, relative to the squared uh, C24 reference scalar. So we take that green reference line and we, we square it. And so we're um, comparing those two areas. In this particular example, the yellow outlined area um, is actually bigger than the green box. It's 103% of that C24 scalar. And we found that the pharyngeal area at rest, on average, um, corresponded to 59% of that C24 uh, scalar. And you can see the confidence interval there. So this particular example represents somebody with unusually large pharyngeal area at rest. Perhaps this represents some sort of dilation. And you might expect other situations where it wouldn't surprise you if the pharyngeal area at rest was uh, smaller. Perhaps uh, cases with surgical swelling or edema related to radiation. Uh, we're still exploring this measure in more detail. I would say it's probably the one that is least solidified in our understanding. 
I should point out that this is similar to the measure of pharyngeal area that Dr. Rebecca Leonard uses as the denominator in her pharyngeal constriction ratio, um, except that Dr. Leonard decided to adopt a convention of taking this measurement on a frame where one milliliter of thin liquid is held in the person's mouth. And she does that once at the beginning of each video fluoroscopy. So we're continuing to explore variation in this measure to try to understand uh, how stable it is. Um, but I hope that these measures are at least useful to give you some sense of whether your patient might have an abnormally large or uh, narrow pharynx. And then we measure pharyngeal area on the frame of maximum constriction. This method is very similar to that used by Dr. Leonard for the top part of her pharyngeal constriction ratio uh, measure. We don't find it necessary to calculate the ratio. We simply look at the unobliterated area of the pharynx on the frame of maximum constriction. So that could be full of bolus, as shown in this example, or it might be full of air, or some combination of the two. And in this particular example, that yellow outlined area corresponds to almost 4% of the C24 squared reference area. And uh, that's abnormally poor constriction or outside the normal uh, limits for constriction. In our data set, we found on thin liquids that complete obliteration was the norm with under 2% of that area being traceable. And then finally, in terms of the measures in the aspect method, we move on to using similar pixel-based methods to trace residue. Now, there are a number of different approaches in the literature to measuring residue. And so I'm showing you here an illustration of these measures. These are all pixel-based methods as opposed to ordinal judgments. And they look at the bolus that is left behind in the pharynx uh, rather than trying to determine what percent of the original bolus uh, is left as residue. So here you can trace the uh, two-dimensional lateral view of residue uh, and figure out how many pixels it is, and then you can express uh, that measure uh, in different ways. A common um, threat uh, to the validity of these measures that's been raised historically is to point out, of course, that when we look at a lateral view video fluoroscopy like this and we trace residue, we're looking through a three-dimensional uh, reality. And so there's been a doubt uh, in the literature for a while about how um, how well these sagittal view images represent the 3D volumetric reality. And a recent paper by Rachel Mulherin and colleagues, I hope, has put this to rest and shown really um, quite strong correlations between 2D measures and 3D measures taken on a very high resolution um, 3D CT system in Japan. So here's one uh, first method that you might consider for expressing residue, that is to trace the residue uh, shown here in the yellow outline, and then to express that as a percent of the space in which the residue is sitting. So for example, how a percent of the vollecula, how full is that vollecula? And this has been one convention that we've um, used for a while. And so the vollecula area is represented in the image by the white outline and similarly for the piriform sinuses. And using this, you can come up with a more quantified estimate of how full those spaces are. You could also take that yellow area and divide it instead by the C24 squared reference area shown by the green dashed lines and get a sense of the degree to um, which the pharynx or an uh, estimate of the pharynx is full of residue in each space. Uh, and that's shown on the bottom of the slide. So in this particular example, the first approach uh, gives a result of the vollecula being about two-thirds full and the piriform sinuses being about three-quarters full. And when you express those instead as a percent of the C24 squared reference scalar, you get measures of 11% and 14% respectively. 
Now, both of these approaches are part of the equation for the normalized residue ratio scale measure, which we've been using for about five years following the development of this measure by Dr. Bill Pearson in collaboration with Dr. Malfenter. And if you're not already familiar with this measure, there's a couple of publications describing it. And one of the advantages of this measure was that it gives a continuous unit that is very useful for statistics. However, over time, we uh, have come to appreciate that particularly the percent full part of the equation, that deciding how big that space is and how full it is, is something that's very vulnerable to differences in frame selection. So that epiglottis could change in its position across adjacent frames, and that could make your estimate of where the boundaries of that space are quite different from frame to frame, and those would impact influence the percent full calculation. And that could also be true of the piriform sinuses. They could be more or less dilated from frame to frame. Additionally, we've come to appreciate over time that, in fact, the white line shown on the molecular space tracing really isn't the top of the molecular space. It's a tracing of the space between the epiglottis and the tongue base. But the upper lip of where the molecular uh, space pockets actually lie is probably not the top of that white space. And if you were looking at this endoscopically, you would have quite a different sense of whether those spaces are full to the brink and about to overflow uh, from what we might see on fluoro. And so our recommendation is to move towards using this percent of the C2 for squared reference scalar as the measure that is less susceptible to differences in frame selection. And so in this data set on healthy thin liquid swallowing, we found that the upper boundary for post-swallow residue was less than 1% of that C24 squared area in the vollecula uh, and in the piriform sinus, and even if you put the two of them together, so that um, residue really appears to be exceptionally rare in healthy swallowing of thin liquids. So to summarize at this point, what does normal thin liquid swallowing look like based on these data? It's a, a sip volume of about 12 milliliters, one single swallow for that bolus, uh, complete laryngeal vestibule closure, no penetration or aspiration, and none to minimal residue. So then what happens as we go thicker? And just to remind you, we went from uh, thin right up to extremely thick using xanthan gum thickened stimuli, uh, still in that 20% weight to volume barium concentration. So the first thing that we discovered, which really was kind of frustrating and an artifact of science, uh, was that the sip volume became smaller as things got thicker. And uh, so that happened from thin to slightly thick to mildly thick. Um, the, the thicker consistency sip volume was slightly smaller, but it happened more when we went to the extremely thick and moderately thick stimuli, which were served by spoon, as I mentioned before. And in fact, you'll see the bolus was ever so slightly larger for the extremely thick than it was for the moderately thick liquids. And we actually think this is displaying um, one of the IDC testing methods, and that is um, that the uh, level four extremely thick liquids mound on a spoon and don't drip off the edges, and you can actually um, build, if you will, a slightly larger um, mound or bolus on the spoon without it, risk of it falling off. But the level three moderately thick stimuli, which still flow, um, can't maintain that mound on the spoon and they flow over the edges. And that's probably why they were ever so slightly smaller. Um, but a confound in our work is that these thicker stimuli were more in the range of five milliliters, whereas the sipped uh, thinner stimuli were more in the range of 10 to 12 milliliters. And we can't be entirely certain, therefore, that the differences we're looking at are not a function of sip volume rather than consistency. And we'll still be exploring that as we move forward with our work. What else changed, though? So uh, importantly, swallow reaction time becomes longer. 
the time between the bolus passing the ramus of the mandible and the onset of the hyoid burst is significantly longer uh, for the um, moderately and extremely thick liquids compared to the thinner liquids. And even within those thinner liquids, you see a gradient of slightly longer times the thicker the bolus is. And I think this simply reflects uh, bolus flow that thicker boluses move more slowly, and therefore uh, you don't need to initiate hyoid uh, movement quite as fast um, with thicker liquids. Uh, similarly, when we look at where the head of the bolus is uh, with the thicker liquids, and corresponding to this finding, we saw that with the moderately and ex extremely thick liquids, that bolus was less likely to have already reached the piriform sinuses at the frame of swallow onset. Uh, then, when we look at laryngeal vestibule closure phenomena, we already know that the hyoid burst is starting later uh, with the thicker liquids. But interestingly, uh, the time it took that hyoid to move uh, far enough to facilitate laryngeal vestibule closure was shorter. Uh, so something about these thicker liquids elicited faster movement and a shorter time to laryngeal vestibule closure. When we look at penetration and aspiration, of, of course, this is a data set of healthy uh, people and penetration and aspiration was quite unusual in our data set. You can see that the percentage of people who showed at least one event of a penetration aspiration scale score of two or higher goes down as the consistencies get thicker so that it's exceptionally unusual with the extremely thick liquids. Other changes, we found that UES opening diameter actually became smaller with thicker liquids. Um, that might not be uh, what you would expect, but this we believe is probably more illustrative of, a, of the influence of smaller sip volumes than it is of thicker consistencies, uh, because the historic literature suggests that the opening of the UES is highly accommodating of differences in bolus volume. So those were the changes uh, according to thicker liquids, not a great number of them. Uh, and so what remained unchanged? This is, I hope, helpful for you clinically in terms of what you might expect when you're looking at different consistencies. The first thing is the sequencing didn't change. Um, many of the timing measures didn't change. So we found um, that that pharyngeal phase duration from hyoid burst onset to UES opening was highly stable across consistency. Laryngeal vestibule closure, how long it stayed closed, didn't change. And the uh, corresponding and closely related duration of UES opening didn't change. A peak hyoid position didn't change. Um, neither did the degree of pharyngeal constriction. We saw effectively complete pharyngeal constriction regardless of consistency. And post-swallow residue also did not markedly change. There were some slight differences, but the upper boundaries on um, those total overall measures of uh, residue in the vellecula, the piriforms, and anywhere else all added together um, as a percentage of that C24 squared reference scalar um, were under uh, 2%, so under 1.5%. So uh, so that, uh, I think, is helpful. We don't expect to see more residue with thicker consistencies. So where do we go next? Well, in our lab, of course, we're interested to look at what happens in people with dysphagia or other groups. We're well on our way to completing a comparative data set in healthy older adults um, and uh, also, also older adults who have identified dysphagia risk, perhaps with no clear um, uh, explanation for why they might report symptoms of swallowing difficulty. Uh, we're wanting to look at stroke and traumatic brain injury. Uh, we've just completed a data set in uh, participants with ALS in collaboration with Dr. Emily Plowman at the University of Florida. 
Uh, we have a data set going on Parkinson's disease. Uh, we've completed a data set on uh, spinal cord injury patients at the rehabilitation stage, um, and also one on oropharyngeal cancer patients treated with radiation. Uh, we hope to move on to um, other types of head and neck cancer, including those treated with surgery, and also to start to look at a group with um, COPD. Those are our plans. Uh, and related to that, of course, as an output of this research enterprise, we hope to then develop from this work um, a clinical decision-making tool that will be useful for you as clinicians involving key aspect measures um, and to start to begin on what it looks like to apply this process uh, to the interpretation of video fluoroscopies in a clinical sense. And so uh, just a heads up that we um, hope to be presenting case studies uh, using this method at this year's ASHA convention in Orlando. So in summary then, uh, using this aspect method, we can define reference values for healthy swallowing, starting with thin and then looking at other consistencies. Uh, we can identify other expected variations, perhaps across sex and age uh, groups or when using maneuvers. And we can characterize differences in people with dysphagia of different etiologies uh, with information that will help us to understand their mechanisms of impairment um, and then building on this, um, these mechanisms, we hope, will point us to preferred uh, treatment approaches to mitigate those issues. So that concludes the talk, and given that I'm re-recording, I just wanted to end by representing some of the questions that came up after my talk uh, for the Dysphagia Rounds group. The first question was, um, how do I interpret situations where the bolus is already at the level of the piriform sinuses before swallow initiation? Should this be something that we're concerned about clinically? And my answer is as follows. First of all, um, uh, it is uh, not abnormal for the head of the bolus to reach that point uh, on thin liquid swallows, and I think we need not to uh, consider that impairment um, in and of itself. However, it depends how long it sits there. Uh, so if it's there for one frame and then keeps going and, and the hyoid movement starts in a timely fashion, then I would not be concerned about this. Um, but if it sits there and you can see it sitting there for more than a couple of frames, uh, then I think we are dealing with an impairment, probably less an impairment of, um, of bolus location and one of swallow initiation. And of course, uh, if the laryngeal vestibule is wide open when the bolus is sitting in this location, then uh, that might well represent a situation of risk. And so that would be how I would think through uh, that particular scenario. Uh, related to that, I had a question to clarify how bolus consistency impacts that bolus location at swallow onset measure. Uh, and so just to um, uh, reiterate, we found uh, that with thicker consistencies, um, there was still this uh, trend for bolus to be spread right across the levels uh, of bolus location in Dr. Martin Harris's scale. However, they were more likely to be at the higher levels um, and less likely to be at the piriform sinuses as we got thicker, so particularly for the moderately and extremely thick boluses. Uh, now, something I didn't actually mention in my talk, but did uh, today, but did mention before, is that in our work uh, looking at penetration and aspiration, uh, we've recently published a paper in the Dysphagia Journal where we found that um, the ability to catch penetration and aspiration uh, in a patient. Uh, it really requires more than one uh, bolus presentation. Uh, and our recommendation, in fact, is that uh, you should, um, if you want to rule out penetration and aspiration, you need to repeat that thin liquid swallowing task four times uh, to have confidence that that person is completely safe. 
Uh, and so I had a question about that comment, and particularly about the fact that this kind of repetition isn't something built into the MBS IMP. Uh, so let me just clarify our finding. So uh, this was a study, in fact, where patients uh, took six single sips of thin liquid barium, again, with a natural sip um, sizing protocol and no cued swallow. And the boluses were in that study also in the order of 12 milliliters per bolus. And we found that on the these were people at risk of dysphagia. Uh, we found that on the first presentation, 8% of those individuals showed a penetration aspiration scale score of 3 or worse. Uh, on the second bolus presentation, a new 7% of people uh, showed a problem. So we moved from 8% to 15%. And then on the third, another 3% more of that sample showed their first episode of concern. And then um, from sort of four, boluses four, five, and six leveled off. And so our conclusion was that if we had stopped after only the first bolus, we would have incorrectly um, scored uh, at least 10% um, of, um, of the sample as not having a problem with airway protection, when indeed later boluses showed that they did. Um, so uh, our recommendation was to suggest that you should look more than once, and ideally about four times, uh, to be confident in your finding. The MBS IMP, of course, collects two 5 milliliter thin liquid boluses at the beginning and ignores the first one. Uh, and then there is repetition in the MBS IMP, but it comes with increases in bolus volume, so from 5 to 10 and so forth. Um, and so it doesn't include strict repetition of the task. And one could say that as those tasks um, proceed and the boluses are larger, that the challenge challenge gets more difficult. And indeed, um, there's work from that group that suggests that the sequential liquid swallowing task that follows tends to reveal the most issues with airway protection. So I think that my comments would be, uh, first of all, that the studies are different, um, the bolus volumes are different, um, but that I don't personally think a single bolus is adequate. Um, and I um, think that if you see a safe swallow, um, repeating it uh, to, to be sure that there isn't airway invasion is a prudent thing to do. And finally, I had a comment at the end that this aspect method seems like it's a very detailed approach. It would take a very long time. And so how long does it take to complete this analysis for a single patient? And the truth is that I can't answer this question yet because we haven't been applying it in this way. We've been doing it in a research context. Um, we do hope to have an answer for you on this by the ASHA convention, and we have started to try to analyze uh, patients um, in sort of a single assessment context using this approach. And my, um, my personal expectation is that we will find that we hone in on particular measures in the method um, that are most likely to tell the story first. And I think those will be laryngeal vestibule closure integrity um, and laryngeal vestibule closure reaction time in terms of swallowing safety and on pharyngeal constriction with respect to clearance and efficiency and measures of residue. Um, and uh, so when I do this, I can um, uh, personally at the moment um, get a really comprehensive set of measures for a single patient from a typical video fluoroscopy in about 20 minutes. Um, but we hope to be able to simplify that process for clinicians to really point them to particularly informative um, parameters um, and where you're best to spend your time and have uh, a secondary set of measures that uh, you can turn to if you need to dig further and get more information.
So that is where I will end this presentation. I hope you found it useful and uh, we'd be happy to receive questions uh, regarding this method uh, through our lab email or via Facebook um, or Twitter. And please do follow us there. As soon as the manuscript is, in, is available, we will um, release a link to it and it will be open access um, and we'd be happy to uh, discuss it uh, with you uh, once it's available. Thank you for your attention.